Another lightning rod week in politics, from fights over splitting up families at the border to a new round of tariffs as the trade war ratchets up with China. And we'll set the stage for Thursday's big GOP gubernatorial debate from our studios in downtown Detroit. Today is Sunday, June 24, 2018, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint on this first Sunday of the summer. And tomorrow night, we will again renew one of Detroit's most singular summer sensations, the Ford fireworks along the Detroit River. It will once again be a celebration of all of the renewal happening downtown. Those fireworks now reflect their gleam on buildings that are increasingly active and increasingly full. I invite you to come be a part of it. Or, of course, we hope you'll follow our exclusive coverage of one of the best nights of any year in Detroit. We'll have the full evening for you starting live tomorrow night at 8 on Local 4 and on Click on Detroit. It is a big week at Local 4 because three days after that, we'll be hosting the Republican candidates for governor in a debate that will originate from this very studio live Thursday night. We're going to talk about the stakes for that showdown a little later on. But up first this morning, we're going to talk about the immigration battle, which has a ripple effect that is now running right into Michigan. The west side of the state is one of the destinations destinations for the children who've been taken from parents who crossed the border illegally. Now, the president signed the ex executive order ending those separations, which was basically an oddly a fix for a problem his administration insisted on. But getting the families already separated back together is a different matter. We're going to talk about asylum this morning. We're also going to talk about the tariff fight. Last week we focused on Canada. Now the president amps up his fight with China. And how much should politicians have to say about what is taught in our schools? It's all this morning, a busy morning on Flashpoint. We are going to start with immigration this morning. I'm not sure another debate along the usual dividing lines is all that helpful. I would like to focus this morning on the idea of asylum. That's what many of those arriving at our borders are seeking. How and to whom should we grant that protective shield? Very glad to have with me this morning U of M law professor uh, Margot Schlanger, who is a leading authority on civil liberties. Deb Drennan is here, executive director of Freedom House, and Magladys Bermudez, uh, a site uh, attorney for Justice for Our Neighbors. So, gang, thanks very much. Uh, I, Deb, I'd like to start with you, mm -hmm. because this idea of asylum, that's what a lot of these people are claiming. You, uh, Freedom House is, I guess, a pretty... Um, tidy way of, of working that that pro that program that problem you've got people who are seeking asylum applying for asylum in all the right ways but I know you don't think that you're catching all the people that you need to yeah that's correct and as McGladys will talk about later the legal aspect yeah. of that so Freedom House works with folks uh, asylum seekers who come into the United States under inspection and they come and to the border and say I'm seeking asylum I, I can't return there's something called a well-founded fear which McGladys will talk about yeah they meet that um, requirement. And so the United States allows them one year to apply for asylum. And Freedom House, we have the legal aid, we have the housing, and what we call the comprehensive services. So um, a part of the uh, well-founded fear, persecution, torture. So providing with community partners um, all of the services, including English language. And somebody seeking that needs sort of a sponsor, uh, in a way, or somebody that, that says that they're going to be with them, and you provide that. You are. Well, not the same way as with um, folks coming through the, some, the border. Through the border. No, it's that, different. yeah. So, well, then, McGladys, explain to me then it, it's not enough for me to say, look, m life in my country stinks. Uh, the economy's terrible. I just need another place to live. That's not. That's not really asylum, right? No, it's not. You need to show that you have a well-founded fear of returning to your government due on, uh, based on some enumerated grounds, which could be political opinion, it uh, could be religion, and it could be a particular social group. Sometimes that can be constructed as simply being um, like some of our uh, the people that are turning in in the South. Uh, having organized crime yeah, in the yes. in the in the country um, they have to go through something called a credible fear test and that's done by an agent at the border and they ask questions are you afraid of going back to your country so if they pass that then well, of course they're going to say that they're afraid to go back to their country they I, I would assume at that point they know that the other answer wouldn't get them in but how do we determine whether or not sending them home is some kind of a death sentence it's m because it's more than just the fear the fear has to be based on one of the enumerated grounds so you, let's say your fear is simply um, violence 
that is not enough for you to be granted asylum in the United States. The fear has to be on one of the enumerated grounds. Uh, Professor, you uh, recently co-wrote a piece in the Washington Post that talked about uh, kind of these people who are arriving and what their lives are like. They, they, they can't be so out of the loop as to not be getting word that when you arrive at the U.S., you might have your family ripped apart. Now, that's changed with the executive order. But before that, weren't they aware that that was what they might be getting into? I think it's hard to say. There's there's two different ways that the families that came here that had their family their their children taken away from them yeah. were arriving. Some of them were presenting at the border like we just heard. They arrive at the border, it's completely legal. They explain their fear, they talk about why they're afraid, they demonstrate that it's a credible fear. And some of those families, not all, but quite a few, were having their kids taken away. In addition, even though they were doing this in a legal manner, even though they were doing it in a legal manner, some of them were having their kids taken away. That's something that the government has admitted to, but hasn't made front and center in this whole debate. They'd like to make that part go away because they're focused on the other piece, which is when people um, make it through the border without inspection. So they get they 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 cross sneaking the border, the they sneak into yes. the country between the ports, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and then they get caught. Um, on the time that they get caught, they say to the agent who catches them, I have a fear of, of persecution. Um, it's not a code word, it's not a magic word. They demonstrate that it's real. They have another interview, or they're supposed to have another interview. And at that point, the government, the, the Trump administration has said, you know what? We're not even gonna think about that right now. We're gonna send you to jail. We're going to take your kids away. We're going to send you to jail. And when you get out of jail, because it's a misdemeanor entering without inspection, mm -hmm. when you get out of jail in six, seven, 10, 12 days, then we'll talk about your fear of persecution. They take the kids away. They move them someplace else. The person gets out of jail 10, 12, whatever days away. They go looking for their kid, and the kid is nowhere to be found. We have this, what looks to be a logistical nightmare now, of trying to get these all these families back together, uh, which really hasn't been provided for in the executive order, but how do we begin yes. to do that? So we got a lot of them in Michigan now. We do, we do, and there are four different agencies involved in all of this, and they have no centralized database, they have no centralized <laughs> list, and people have very common names, right? Yep. Right, yep. you and I don't have common names, but lots of people have common names, mm -hmm. and so, and some of the kids are pre-verbal or don't know their own last name, right? So you have some kid and she says, well, I'm Anna and my mother is Maria and that's all she's got, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you've got Maria who says, my kid is Anna, has a last name, of course, and doesn't know where they are. The government has completely abandoned its responsibility to do anything about that. Well, Deb, a lot of Americans, though, right now say, look, this is a terrible onus to put on us mm -hmm. to provide facilities for all these people who uh, ha are suddenly walk their way in. Many of them are in need of health care. Mm -hmm. They obviously need to be clothed and fed. Mm -hmm. But that's not fair to ask the uh, American people to take care of that. How do we create? Yeah. A system of support. Yeah, I'm not an economist. We'll start yeah. right there. Um, however, <laughs> you play one to know, yeah, I yes. will. So to uh, to also understand is that immigration law prohibits an asylum seeker during this application process to earn an income. So the law says you can't work. So let's be clear about that. Mm -hmm. And um, but so for that how long for what could be a long period of time? Could be about a year. a year. Yeah, the application, yes. okay. and then you wait six months yep. to apply. Yep. So there is that. Um, and then uh, the question with that in mind is, so Freedom House providing the housing, we help folks seventy dollars a day is what it costs us to provide the legal aid, the, the comprehensive um, social work, mental health. We have master's level social worker, excellent attorney, attorneys. So providing the service $70 a day seems a lot if you're comparing it to other service providers. But housing, clothes, food, toiletries, so the things you want to buy but you can't because you can't earn an income, right? We provide all of that for $70 a day. So the myth of it's going to cost us all this money, it's, it, that's just not true. It is more economically advantageous to provide support, legal support, housing support, social support. You know, we have residents um, who've been um, a, a couple that are opening their own market. They're going to be in Midtown pretty soon, Bauba Fair. That's an example of what they contribute back to the community. They're, this myth that they're just going to sit around and commit their crimes here 
just that's as a, a recent case that's gotten uh, some notoriety. Yeah. But we're glad it's really then the way that our system is set up. Then we're kind of asking people to be people of means who are going to seek this. They've got to be able to afford a plane ticket here, perhaps, for where yep. they're coming from. They've got to be able to afford to live on their savings for a, up to a year. Uh, that that that's not the group of people that we're seeing at the border. It feels it's it's not. Uh, there's very few privileged immigrants that get to. Uh, come in with a visa and then seek asylum with a visa in their hand. Mm -hmm. Not many get to do that. Um, so the people that we're seeing in the border are people that, first of all, would never get a visa granted from their country, mm -hmm. and secondly, wouldn't have the money or the means to get that visa granted. Uh, so they're coming in, they're seeking asylum here. Now, how much, I'm not sure how much it's costing us to keep all these children, right? <laughs> it's, it, oh. When you separate it from their family, now their family doesn't become responsible for them anymore. The U.S. government becomes responsible right. for them. So the act of separating from their family is putting more responsibility on the U.S. government than there should be. Which is a, an enormous ask of both the government and the American people in a way, isn't it? I mean, how do we... Well, I think of it the opposite of that. Okay. I think that what the administration is doing right now is costing the taxpayers. Yes. And yeah. the yeah. alternative, which is to allow the families to go, monitored perhaps. Maybe. Don't we only fairly have to say, though, that other administrations have cost taxpayers money with our immigration policy every, as well? Every administration has cost okay. taxpayers yes. money with yes. their, with their but, but there has never been mm -hmm. uh, an effort like this one to hold kids so many kids for so long who have families who could take care of them and all of these families now because the the trump administration's sort of phase two is okay fine we won't separate the kids we'll just put everybody in jail mm -hmm. into some kind indefinite of yes, right yes that's going to cost a lot more than mm -hmm. it would cost to let them go yeah. and so in fact the, this administration's approach is not saving money, it's actually costing yeah. money. And you know, Freedom House was founded in 1983 because of the crisis at the southern border during the Salvadorian War. So you see there are solutions. Um, and so I just want to remind folks that. You, you, you yeah. well, the three of you have a much closer glimpse of this than uh, most of us, and I'm really appreciative of the, of the insights you've Thank you. Thanks Thank very you. much for being Thank here. You. We come back, got a lot more to talk about with the round table this morning, uh, including a new tariff war with China. This is Flashpoint. I told you.